Hey there, everyone. Hey there, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Freelance Roundtable. I'm Valerie Bordeaux, and joining me today is all of the rest of our roundtable, except for one. We have Dana Sitar of DIY Writing. Say hi, Dana. Hello. <laughs> I'm glad you could be with us today. We have Kelly Boyer Sagard of kbsagard.com. Hello. And we have Sophie Lizard of Be a Freelance Blogger. Hello. And we have one member who is not with us today because Robert is off in Afghanistan serving our country and protecting us and fighting for our freedom. So we just want to say real quick, Robert, that we miss you. The Kingdom of Padalot misses you and we hope that you come back safe and we salute you for all of the work that you're doing over there. Joining us today is James O. Barnes of Locaneal Publishing and he's going to share with us today about what we should know about hiring a publisher, um, information about small press publishing, and help us figure out what kind of red flags would, that we should be looking for. So if you have any questions at any time about publishers, small press publishing, um, dealing with them, feel free to ask us a question with our Q&A app and uh, we'll get to your questions throughout the show. So welcome James to the Freelance Roundtable. Welcome, happy to be here. So tell us about small press publishing and Locanil publishing. Well, Locanil publishing is a small press. Uh, we're a small traditional press. We're multi-genre. We do uh, fiction, uh, any areas of fantasy, sci-fi, uh, we do inspirational children's mystery suspense, and then we also do various different types of uh, nonfiction, business and education. One of the other companies that we have also is called Handcar Press, and it is for author and publisher services. Now that one is if authors are interested in going the self-publishing route uh, through author and publisher services, they can um, basically uh, get walked through the whole process one-on-one. -on -one. It's more of a publisher partnership um, than, than, uh, than the traditional publishing or the self-publishing. So what does someone who is interested in writing a book, what do they need to know about hiring a small press publisher? Well, whenever someone's publishing a book, it's not so much that they're hiring a small press publisher. Um, it depends upon what the company provides for them. And there's a number of different ones out there between uh, Vanity Press, um, a company that might say they're a self-publisher. But I guess the definition of self-publishing should be clarified first. Self-publishing is where you, the author, you're doing everything. That means you also, in, in, including owning the ISBN, um, and ISBN, that tracking number that's on the back, and I only say that because I was doing a presentation the other day and someone didn't know what an ISBN was. Can't take anything for granted. <laughs> but, hey James, um, can, you, can you tell why people need an ISBN? Because I'm not sure everyone knows that either. Yes, uh, and that's what I explained to her as well. The ISBN, uh, which is right on the back of your book, and it uh, tracks it. There's a 13 number, 10 number. Every bookstore uses that if you're getting your book placed in the bookstores. Um, your ISBN is tracked directly back to the publisher. It says who the publisher is also. Uh, and actually who own it kind of goes along with those, who owns those publishing rights. So if you say you're, a, let's say you, or you say that you self-published a book, but yet you do not own the ISBN, you didn't go to uh, one of the ISBN providers, uh, Bowker's, um, that's a B-O-W-K-E-R-S, um, and purchased your own ISBN, it would, th that ISBN goes with the book. So, for example, uh, let's say you used um, Lulu, all right, and you decided to self publish through Lulu, um, but then you, one of the options there, you know, you provide your ISBN or you get Lulu's free ISBN. Technically, Lulu is the publisher of that book. And that goes with uh, iUniverse, Ex Libris, uh, any of those companies that might tout themselves as a self-publisher. 
So technically, they are the publisher of the book. And um, you know, just they, can I ask? Just I don't mean to interrupt, but I. That's okay. Um, so if you don't have an ISBN number, you're basically committing yourself to not having your book in a library or a bookstore. I mean, that limits. That what basically you can do. is correct, also okay. yes, because uh, if you look on the back of any book. Um, now, the barcode is separate, but it's tied to the ISBN, and they can use their scanner just like um, a lot of cell phone apps. You can have those now as well. You can just scan the back of the book. Uh, it's got the barcode there. We always put on ours. We also include in that barcode uh, the price of the book as well. But bookstores, whenever they come in, um, they just scan it right there, and it, they can download that information right away uh, you know, to their system. Just as a side note, one of the big, um, like Borders, for example, one of the big uh, labor-intensive things that Borders always did was they wouldn't use the ISBN barcode that was on there. They would always print their own, um, which is another reason. You know, another reason. You know, they went uh, the way they did. Um, but yeah, you need that ISBN. Uh, libraries use it. Um, bookstores use it. Um, Wholesalers use it, distributors use it, no matter where you are in the world, they use that ISBN code. So you have to have it. So if you're buying a single individual one, and this is why a lot of people who go to self-publish, a single individual one will cost you like $125 for just a single. They're cheaper if you buy them in blocks, of course, too. A block of a 10, 100, 1,000, the more, the cheaper, of course. So. Whenever uh, someone's at that step in Lulu or some other one, then say, "Hey, do you want to provide your own individual ISBN?" And then you say yes, and then you find out, "Oh, it's one hundred twenty-five dollars." Well, I'll just take their free one. You know, so the people who are self-publishing, they need to keep that in mind ahead of time. I mean, it does cost money. <laughs> so, does that prevent you then from that? Does prevent you then from dealing with a traditional publisher in any way? If you don't buy your own ISBN. Well, here, here's the way that goes. Um, because the ISBN is tied directly with the publisher, if you want to take that book, then let's say for some reason, uh, either you're not happy with the company that you published, that you paid to publish it through, and you want to go to another and have a different company do this. That ISBN is tied to that publisher. You will have to have a new ISBN. It is non-transferable. So you cannot just take it and go over. Now, you can still use the same exact book, the, uh, the cover, if you have the license to use that cover. Because if you paid someone to do it, if you don't read the fine print, they could own that cover also. And then you would have to come up with a different cover. But whenever you switch it, let's say you decided to make that move to go ahead and switch it, and that has happened actually recently. We're currently working with an author right now and um, so she's going to have to get a new ISBN. And so basically it's just a second edition is what it is. You can still use the same name, same back of the book blurb, all of that. And it depends upon how you as the author are marketing your stuff. You know, if you've got a good following out there, you just update it. You know, uh, there's been you know, updated version of the book. It's a lot easier if it's nonfiction because you always see second edition, third edition, on so on and so on. But if you're dealing with fiction, um, you'll see those also. Sometimes a different publisher, even with your, you know, your larger New York ones, they'll uh, an author gets picked up by somebody else, or if a book goes out of uh, goes out of print and then they start to do reprints, they're different ISBNs. It's not the same ISBN they've had for like 30 years or whatever. So I mean, it just depends on how you, the author, handle it. I mean, you can switch. And you know, it's another clarification. If someone goes through local Neil Press, so now we're moving away from self-publishing to traditional publishing, you provide that. I mean, there's. There's, you oh, know, yes. it makes it sound like the author always has to pay, but traditional publishing, no. that's not so. Traditional, traditional publishing, um, the pros and cons of traditional publishing, yes, for all of that. You know, we pay for the editing, the illustration, the, the ISBN, all of that. You maintain the copyright because the story is your story. Uh, it's just whenever we contract with our authors and the way majority of all other traditional publishers do, whether it's small press or not, um, you're contracting for the publishing rights, and we typically publish our contract for the print rights, electronic, and audio rights. Uh, and sometimes we include the audio under the electronic, depending on how it's spelled out. And those but are negotiable between author and publisher. Everything is negotiable. Right. 
I mean, yes, you'll get a contract that says, you know, it's got everything, no matter where it comes from. You know, you always read the contract because it's a basic template, you know, and if you've got a good argument why you do not want to, you know, uh, sign another one, then that's good too. And it's also, at least with us being a small press, we want off, we try to sign for all of the rights because we try to do all of those things. Um, and we want authors that are going to be you know, willing to work with us also. Have you ever turned someone down? Let's say you're interested in publishing someone's book and because of the rights, a disagreement about the rights, have you ever withdrawn your offer to publish? From Loquineo as a traditional From, publisher? I'm talking about as traditional publishing I'm talking about. Um, that actually hasn't come up, but uh, it, the, the idea was discussed though, uh, if that would happen. It would really be on a case by case, um, yeah. because right now we are just getting into audiobooks, so uh, we've got a couple of them in the works right now. So yes, we'd want to have audiobook rights, but in all honesty, not every book is audiobook material. <laughs> okay, right. Um, so it could be a case where yeah, we put it in the initial contract, but for some reason they wanted to keep it. It's like, okay, no problem. We'll keep that out. Again, it's a case by case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So sidetracking just a little bit, what makes a book an audiobook material? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the market marketability of it because uh, is one thing. Um, what makes it audiobook material? Uh, really, it's the content. Uh, and the number one thing that every single author needs to realize, whether they're self-publishing, vanity, traditional, is to get their book edited. Um, there are some books out there that, as you're reading through them, uh, you hit what I call speed bumps. You know, it's just if I hit too many speed bumps in the first chapter, it's I, I I pull off the road. You know, I find some other route. You know, I I pick a different book to read. Um, <laughs> and something like that, yeah, would not go well in an audio book. Um, <laughs> it's basically the person narrating it would have to self-edit it as they were going along. Um, but things like that. And it's not so much... It, it's... There are some big-name authors that pretty much no matter what they put out there, you know, it's going to be in an audiobook form also. But for a lesser-known author, I wouldn't necessarily go the audiobook route right away. Um... Because there are other, I guess you could say, text-to-speech, you know, routes that an individual can go. Fiction. Hey. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, fi fiction is a good, usually ahead. a good one also, though, to go for it. I mean, uh, nonfiction. Yeah, we have a question from Joanne McAlpine, and she asks, some of my author friends do not understand the benefits of having a small publisher and feel self-publishing is the way to go. They want to get their own ISBN and UPC. I guess my question is, what is the benefits of publishing through an indie publisher to self-publishing? Benefits of publishing through indie or small presses instead of self-publishing? Uh -huh. Well, there is the well, there's the professionalism. The 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 amount. Not saying that it, you know you couldn't do it self-publishing. When you're self-publishing, true self-publishing, you're setting up your own company. You are the publisher. You're doing the marketing. You're doing the the editing, um, uh, the illustration, uh, all of that. Now that doesn't mean you specifically. You could be contracting with someone to do the editing, contracting with someone to do the illustration, and all of those services. But with a publisher, you've got we know who we deal with as far as editors go and illustrators. Illustrators, uh, as an as uh, as a self publisher, you may not know what you're getting into that route also. But then there's also the distribution. There's the um, uh, the fact that you're not alone. Okay, uh, right now we have a little over a dozen authors, and we've got about 45 books uh, that we've put out in the past uh, four and a half years. A little over four, and a, almost four and a half years. Yeah, it'll be five this summer. Um, but so so there's that route of uh, you're not alone also. But through Handcar Press. Uh, with the publishing partnership also, those books that uh, if they decide that they want to actually have them distributed, um, that can go two ways there. If someone wants to self-publish, they can still go through Handcar Press and 
we'll, we show them how to set up their own publishing company, get their own ISBN, and that's all included in some of the packages. Or they could go the route where Hankar Press has, you know, we get the ISBN that way, and then it's provided, uh, the distribution is provided through a Locanel Select, which is one of our imprints. It kind of basically just means it's like pre-approved, you know, because we know the people you worked with with Hankar Press, and it's all through there. Um, not every traditional company has that with a, with a, uh, a, um, you know, with a self-publish. It's really, it's really a preference, you know. You know, can I ask a question? Like to me, as you know already, I, so far I've always traditionally published, and the reason, a couple, re there's two main reasons why I do it. One, I don't want to pay to be published. I want to get paid, right? So I right. mean, I have a very, you know, I mean, income-based way of looking at it. The other is what I want you to address. Um, certainly, when I started publishing, there was a stigma with self-publishing because people yes. jumped into self-publishing without the editing, without doing quality checks. How do you address that, and do you think that stigma is still there when people uh, sell their books, or is that fading away? It's fading in some circles, but it is still there. Um, with reviews and that sort of thing, still is that yes. still more of a challenge? Okay. Yes, because... Um, when you're self-publishing, it is you can get paid reviews. You know, also, but then is that really a review? Or are you just paying someone to write something nice about your book? Mm -hmm. um, you could pay your neighbor for that. <laughs> right. But there is still some stigma about it, though. Um, and the editing is one of those main reasons. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Skipping how, the editing, right? Skipping the editing, or skipping the editing, or not knowing what to look for in the editing. Because there's the what we call the you know the gum edit that's your basic one that's your grammar usage mechanics, but it's so some editing for whenever you're going for a story it's so much more than that. Um, there's like that complete story arc, where you know you really need to rearrange your chapters, you know or that whole chapter 14 really doesn't even need to be in the book because it has something to do with a character that just gets killed in the next, you know I mean it's that type of stuff um, when people are writing. Uh, People, whenever they're first starting out, the um, keep telling them the best way to be, you know, to be a better writer is to write more. But a lot of people want to publish their first thing that they write, and that shouldn't necessarily be the first thing that you publish. And if you go right out there and they're all excited about it and with great enthusiasm, um, and that will sell some books, even if the editing's off. I mean, that passion and that you know for that and the selling it, that'll still sell some. But eventually it's going to come to the point when the reviews start coming in and people start talking about it and then the word of mouth gets around and then, oh, well, how is that back? Oh, well, it was self-published. Well, that's what we expect. you know. And then it's just that stereotype that goes on and on. That it's getting cycle less continues. And less. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's getting less and less. Um, well, one of the authors that just came to us, actually, she's um, uh, she paid someone to publish her book um, you know, in that, in that aspect, but the editing was kind of off, and um, so we're taking it over right now. And actually, people, she's been nice enough that some of the people that are reviewing her work are finding the mistakes and letting her know about it <laughs> and uh, sending them along. Painful. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, sending them along, and then, you know, we're adding them, to, we're just forwarding them on to our editor and say, hey, keep an eye out for these ones also, which. There's a good chance that our editor is going to catch at least 90% of those, 90, 95 of, that, of what they're already pointing out in addition to uh, what, um, I, I don't say 100%, because when it goes through the editing, a lot of people think it's edited, boom, and back from the editor, it must be all good. Mm -hmm. Well, it still needs to be read. We do a, we go back and forth at least two to three times yeah. with the manuscript, and then we do a PDF print uh, proof. And then after that goes back with any changes, then we do a printed proof. And then we usually send out a couple of printed proofs. Uh, we send them to our readers as well as we send it to the author, too. And we tell them, just write it right in there. And then just ship the book right back. You know, and then we just go through it page by page for anything that they change. Because no matter how much you do electronically, if you're not holding that book in your hand right there, you're still going to miss something. So you're, I mean, that's best practices for the industry. And you're, you're following... All That's what we do. Quality. Yeah, well, and I'm saying those are, I mean, even, yeah. not that I publish with, like, big New York houses, but I do with um, academic kind of presses, and what you're describing is what they do. So what I'm saying right. is you're doing best practices for quality in yeah. the industry. Yeah, I, and I, 
I was always taught, and I, you know, in anything, and I try to teach my own kids as well. You know, if you're going to do something, it's worth doing right. You know, because your name's on it. And Handcar Press, we make no, we don't hide the fact that it's a division of Locanel Publishing, and so we do not want any guilt by association. You know, so we use the for Handcar Press, we use the same illustrators, the same editors, and everything that we use for Locanel Publishing, also. But yeah, as far then, as that, go go ahead. Ahead. no, go okay. ahead. One of the biggest issues, because you were kind of briefly mentioned it a little bit uh, with the, the, the person that you were talking about earlier who came in that you're now redoing the work for, um, that's a, it's a scary thing for a lot of new authors and a lot of things like that because you have to put up so much money right. to get this traditionally published. And if you start to talk around with other authors and other writers, you start to almost hear some horror stories going on of, of, of things that go on. And I, I had a difficult time with this publisher. Um, I'm looking for a new publisher because this one didn't work out so well. And so it really becomes almost an enticement to go the self-publishing route because you're so afraid of what's going to happen when I put all of this money in front of this person to publish my book. You know, that that's true and it's all about the research and education. Because if a person's going to go self-publishing, you know, that, that, that's fine. Um, but you have to run it. I mean, there's the writing side of writing, the creative side, and then there's the business side. And a lot of people don't realize that writing is a business and if you do not dedicate so much time per day or however much you do at least uh, at least 25 if you've got whatever 100 percent of your writing time if it's if you only have like three hours to write a week you know an hour of that should be on the writing of business um, whether it's building your platform as a writer whether it's uh, checking to make the edits that you paid for to have edited uh, the you know, going back and forth with whoever you're paying to illustrate it I um, mean, you have to treat it like a business, and which is sometimes one reason to try to go with the small press also, um, so that you don't have to worry about those things. But then you still have to have some marketing, but you don't have so much of the other intricacies and in dealing with, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, you still have to, uh, it, it's the education and, and, and research of it. If you not all self-publishing presses are the same and they have different price breaks too some of let I me mean, look at the packages um, our packages are up online um, that's handcarpress.com our packages are online but they're guidelines I always say they're guidelines they have a price up there but in order to get a true quote you know you email in and you know get all the details and the specs and then I can actually get one because not like for the our highest want packages like the publisher package it includes some marketing stuff but if you already have a website you don't need that in there okay you should be able to do the same thing with any other self-publishing company that's out there um, talk with them you know find the contact person on there find other people that have published through them as well see if you can get you know uh, the titles and uh, find out who they are, the companies, uh, and then go and you know check them out, check out the product, check out the end product of their book. Um, our books that come out of Hancock Press go through Locono Select. They have this our same logo, Locono Publishing does on the back. Just has a little LS up above it for Locono Select. Um, but you have to ask those questions, and then there's the prices too, because all of the packages include a certain amount. But then there's the a la carte services that you hear you know, those add-on services that they try to get you with, you know. And some of them do not include editing as part of the initial thing. You know, it's like, uh, okay, it's like a thousand dollars or whatever, you know, to, uh, you know, just for a basic publish to get it out there. But it doesn't include any editing or any illustration, or the illustration only includes like a stock image that they can grab anywhere and slap up there, which you could have done yourself. Um, you know, too, one issue about when you're choosing between traditional publishing and self-publishing, one of the deciding factors I think for a lot of people is how much control you want over your book because I don't get to choose my titles. When I traditionally publish they might ask me my opinion and my opinion's worth what it's worth and they name it what they want to name it. So do you want to talk about how you know the different uh, types of publishing allow authors different levels of control over their own yes. product? 
title's an interesting one. I mean, we have some authors with Locanel Publishing who they just love their titles, but um, and you, it's okay to have books that have the same title out there uh, because there are. I mean, you're you're not copywriting the title; you copyright the manuscript. Mm -hmm. And so we always tell our authors when we contract with them, this is the whatever title they came up with. This is the working title with the understanding that we may have to change it. There was one title whenever we first started out. It was the same title as an explicit adult book. You know, so if you did a search on Google, you know, this other book popped up all of the time. Mm -hmm. Should have used a different phrase. Sorry. But um, <laughs> the other, you know. Um, so we had to change the name of the book. Right? The author didn't like that, but, you know, she understood, you know, why we had to. But you, you yes. do get more control with self-publishing. I mean, when you're publishing, -publishing traditionally, yes. ultimately the publisher decides. Yes, yes. If she would have went the self-publishing route, then yes, she could have had the same same one, same title. And that's another thing. Sometimes a lot of people with self-publishing, they get so in love with their title, they don't research what other books are in that same you know that same uh, that same title or very similar. We try to do a search with other similar type books. If it's a fantasy book, we look at. Um, you know, there's different periods of time where you know the industry seems to go through very short titles or one word titles, and then there's long titles uh, for different genres. Those are the type of things we try to keep in mind whenever we are um, coming up with a title or deciding on a final title for a book. So there is more leeway there. Um, how your lettering is done on your cover, like whenever the customer first thing they see is the cover of the book right there, how it's done. Um, uh, you obviously self-publishing, you have more control over that. You have more control over the book blurb that's put on the back of the blurb. You could have this tiny little eight-point font because you wanted to put so much in the book blurb that no one's ever going to read, but you wanted to put it there. Now, whereas we might have scaled that down and to something else that was. Done paragraph or something. Um, there, every aspect of self-publishing you do yourself. You know, you have, uh, you, you pick what you're um, going to be putting on there. You know, you have another question. It says here, how much marketing should be done for an upcoming book? Does it need to be done six months or a year in advance? Well, um, again, that goes basically by the book. Um, six months is good, you know, if you're building your platform. You don't necessarily have to, well, let's say you're an individual author, whether you're, and that, it doesn't matter at any uh, type of publishing, whether it's self or traditional, or if some big publishing house is putting it out there. It's always good for you, the author, to have a platform built out there, and that could be if you have a regular blog that you're putting out there, um, so that you can put little teasers out. You know, it's like, oh, by the way, you know, uh, my book will be out on you know, slap down the title there. If you've got a working cover, you can put an image there, you know, in whatever, so many months. You know, it'll be out this June. But one of the things an author doesn't want to do is just be on there the whole time saying, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book, because, you know, your followers eventually will not be following you anymore uh, because they just, you know. Well, I think I mentioned to Valerie the other day, and one of the things we always mention to all of our authors and anybody we ever meet that's in the writing is people don't buy their book buy your book because they like it they haven't met you yet or they haven't read the book they don't know if they like it they buy your book because they like you and that's especially true with small press and independent authors it's you and your personality that's going to start to sell that book yes the cover helps yes the book description you have yes the reviews help but if you're to put it bluntly a jerk you know you know they're not going to buy your book, um, because, or they're they they may even start to badmouth your book, and they haven't even read it. You know, but they don't like you because or your personality, so they just. You know, you know one know. thing you're really good at, and it's 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 true. The small press itself, but also just you personally, is um, networking and author events. And when you're a traditional in traditional publishing, that's like getting rarer and rarer. So that is one advantage of small press, certainly. Right. Yeah, we, um, we we try to maintain uh, an understanding with our authors to make sure that they let us know where they're at <laughs> so we can promote the events that they're going to as well. Um, being a small press, obviously our budget's limited as well, um, but we try to help them out any way we can that way, and uh, they can post directly right onto our, um, like onto our Facebook and Twitter as well. Um, but one of the things we do through Handcar Press is what's called author events, 
and sometimes yeah, you know, authors can go to these, you know, the smaller shows. They might cost them fifty dollars to set up at a at a book fair or something like that that's going on. But the larger shows where you might see, you know, ten thousand, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand people that come through, it's just too cost effective for an author to get through. One of the things we do with author events, um, we started this about three years ago. It's just this year we decided, hey, we should probably make this a formal thing now. But we started coordinating for like here in, in Cleveland, the uh, IX Center's Christmas Connection. Anywhere between forty to 60,000 people come through there on that uh, weekend right before Thanksgiving. But the booth space is just way too much for an author to get in there for themselves. Um, so we coordinate that with a number of authors. Not all of them are Locono authors. It's just authors that are in the area. Um, and we share it. We share the cost. Uh, we coordinate that, and we've got to make sure there's a hand car press rep that'll be there to make sure, you know, we try to make sure everybody stays hydrated because you're there for, like, you know, 10, 12 hours or whatever, you know, three-day weekend on your feet. It's, you know, I hate to see people dropping over. It's not good for business. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So Valerie was saying, um, she mentioned that authors hear a lot of horror stories about working with small press and decide that it's not worth it or whatever. Um, can you... Tell us what authors should be looking for in a small press. Um, so either like the communication you're getting from the editor or publisher when you submit your book, or the in the contract, or or anything to decide if if we really are getting a better deal than going with self-publishing or looking for a different publisher. Well, definitely the definitely the communication. Um, I wish I, myself. I know I need to communicate better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I wish. Um, <laughs> I do eventually get to all of the emails. You know, sometimes it may take me a little while because we are a small press. Uh, I wear a lot of hats, and it gets you know kind of busy. But it's the honesty in that communication, also. I mean, I don't make anything up. If I'm behind on something, it's you know, hey, this is why. You know, um, I got sick. <laughs> okay, or uh, the editor dropped off the place of the, you know, dropped off the face of the earth. You know, so uh, we had to switch it to another editor. You know, there's a multitude of different things that can happen, but it's it's how much. Whereas with self-publishing, yes, you have all the control. With small press, you should still have at least a say in the title, a say in the cover, um, the interior layout design. We're able to work with authors more, um, you know, on the on their baby basically you know their their creation there a little bit more so that um, it's something that they're happy with and they feel good about going out there and marketing themselves and that we do also it's kind of a two-way street right there sometimes you get into larger publishing houses and you know you get the they get the script and it's well this is the way it goes you know and you don't really have a choice on that and then sometimes even with that you get very little. You either get no or very little to minimal uh, any marketing, you know, expense in there, um, you know, from them, and you still have to foot the bill for something that you may not totally be happy with. Um, but it's communication and their willingness to communicate. Um, you can usually tell when you're talking with someone how evasive they are. I try to meet with all of our authors in person when we actually sign the contract. Um, I just like to see their. I like to see their, their eyes, you know, their face, you know, whenever we're talking because you can tell a lot more than you can over an email. Uh, with, I try to make sure that they all know the realities of being an author. Okay, uh, only five percent of the author of authors actually make a living at being an author. They write full time. This is how they make their one hundred percent of their pay. You know, is from what they make from writing, and that's only about five percent. I mean, every, everybody else, you know, they work. You know, I mean, they they've got another job or full time job, or they're writing part time. Um, now, I wasn't including part time in that five percent. I mean, because there's a lot of people that write part time, and then they also have another job as well. But as far as making a living, paying all of their bills, that's a very low percentage. You know, James, the word that comes to mind is transparency. I, you know, you, yeah. you're very willing to lay out, this is what it costs, this is what I'm going to give. I mean, I've seen lots of your paperwork, and I think transparency is really what I would look for. Yeah, that's the word I was looking with, for. When I'm yeah. choosing who to work with. <laughs> yeah. So what about red flags, then? Um, yeah, I was just going to ask that. 
I'll sorry, get what? really excited on that first acceptance um, and just take whatever contract a, a publisher puts in front of them. So what, what should we look for as red flags to move on oh, wow. despite that excitement? Um, a contract without an end date. Okay. I believe that every contract should have an end date. Um, our contracts typically are five years, uh, but they also have an out as well. Um, let's say one of our authors got picked up by a really big name, which I know could provide them more than us. You know, as long as they don't badmouth me, and I, I don't have a problem with it. It kind of helps me out because you know, it looks like, hey, look, so and so got their start with Locono Publishing, small press. That's good, but they have an out though. I mean, and I wouldn't begrudge any author that you know because that's their business. That's what they want to be their business. I mean, that's just me though. Um, but you need red flags though. You need to look. The contract needs to have an end date, and it shouldn't be an exorbitant, you know, like you know, 10, 15, whatever. You don't want a, a huge one out there. And you, you also want to have some sort of an end date there. Yes, someone can get out of one of our contracts, but anything that we have, like in stock, we still need to have at least a year afterwards to continue to sell that stock off. Um, just to help, because we're small press, to recoup the cost that we put out for any of the stock we already, you know, purchased out. But that's, you know, that's the out. You know, as far as contracts go, uh, the rights. Anybody that's not willing to at least discuss the negotiability, you know, of the rights. I mean, typical now worldwide rights because of how easy access electronic is. I mean, that's a stand, pretty much a standard in contracts now. You know, if someone says, you know, I don't want to, I only want to do U.S. rights. Well, our books are available all over the world. You know, I mean, you limit limit the possibility of sales in other countries um, by not having that in. But I don't know if it says uh, if they're not willing to at least, you know, discuss that. I mean, and what uh, about? Oh, sorry. What What about royalties on traditional publishing? What we've not, we haven't talked about that at all. Yeah, and those are in the contract as well. But I'm um, saying those could be red flags. If I saw 5%, okay, red flag, red flag, right? Well, it all depends. Uh, royalties are different, and royalties are another thing that are not, I mean, you have a general, but they're not a definite in every single contract. They're not the same. With ours, they pretty much are, but in general, from company to company, they can be different. And it can be different how, they, how they're figured as well. Like yes. one contract might have... Um, let's say you get 10% um, of the, you know, of what the book sells for. Well, if the book has a has a $15 price tag on it, and you get 10%, so you're thinking, okay, that's a buck fifty. Well, that book gets distributed or goes through a wholesaler, and then that book winds up selling for, you know, selling to them for like seven bucks. Or well, let's say seven fifty, just to keep it easier for my math. My wife's the math teacher. I'm not. <laughs> so with uh, let's say it's discounted for seven fifty. Well, so you're actually not getting ten percent of the fifteen dollar book. You're getting ten percent of the seven dollar fifty book. So you're, some authors don't understand that. And but that's just one so, way. Another one might might go. It's ten percent so I mean of the retail growth. cost. What's that? James, I don't want to interrupt, but I'm just saying, so you're talking net and gross. You have to watch for those kind of yes, terms? Yes, you need to look for those terms of whether okay. it's whether the royalties are on the net or whether they're on the gross, and if it covers uh, how it's done electronically as well. For us, our typical one is 8% off of the retail price, okay, or the gross, so the retail price. Um, and we just do that across the board. Some other company might do 10%, but off of the net sale. Um, and sometimes it might turn out to be the same amount. It's just that, you know, it's like hey, someone saying, um, hey, 10% sounds good. I get 10% instead of 8%. Well, you have to look at the full picture. Is it, what's it 10% of or 8% of? Um, and then if you've got an agent too, uh, which is a whole other red flag area, uh, if you've got an <laughs> agent as well, um, they get their percentages out of yours too. So you get your royalty and, and then they're paid out of your royalties also. And what about an advance? I think it, I don't know whether you give advances, don't give advances, but I think people don't understand the connection right. between an advance and how that affects your royalties. That's a key question there too. Um, 
We at this point, as a small press, we're not able to do advances at this point right now. But Which isn't unusual for small press. Exactly. That's, I mean, that's not a red we, flag. And typically, advances, uh, even with your larger publisher, published companies, are um, they some of them still do not offer advances. Uh, some of them are starting to go lower as well. But the advance is just an advance on your royalties. So if you're reading your contract and you get an advance of a certain, you know, x x amount of dollars, that it, you don't actually receive any royalties until they match what that advance was, and then after at after that advance is matched, then you'll start to get royalties. Now, in some cases, depending on how that contract is worded, if your royalties do not, you know meet enough for the advance, you may wind up having to pay the publisher back part of your advance that didn't that didn't get covered by sales. Major red flag. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you need to but either way though, advance is tied to royalties. And, that's and what how, about sorry, what about like expenses? I had a contract that I could spend five hundred dollars on photos, but I didn't get royalties until the publisher was paid back that either. So not saying that's wrong, right or wrong, but you have to watch for those kind of right. things. In, in a way that's kind of an advance. Because Right, you know, it was, really. They covered my expenses. Exactly. And then they because they want to recoup their costs that way. Um, but yes, that's uh <laughs> royalties are are an area that uh, are a lot of confusion for people. Um, and the difference between royalties, um, just going back to the self-publishing also. So with self-publishing, you do not have royalties. Uh, what you get, so should be getting is what's called the net sales. So if you're self-publishing and it's getting distributed out there for you, they should be keeping out you know, like whatever that manufacturing costs, and then they're going to probably put on a distribution charge as well, and then you get what's left. Um, but typically, some self-publishing companies charge you higher for your book cost. Um, say, like our authors, for example, our average cost of our book is fourteen ninety-five, and so our authors then um, they get uh, like a forty-five percent discount or fifty, depending upon what the book is, that they can purchase it and then, or whenever they go places to sell stuff. Um, but not all companies are that way, and when it comes to self-publishing. You're the one that's paid to have it developed. So really, the only thing additionally you should be paying for is just that manufacture cost, um, the cost of the book, um, and then all of the rest of it. You know, should be yours. You, you, those because you can find red flags in your self-publishing contracts as well as you do your small press contracts. Is basically what I'm trying to say. And how so, often do you give statements? How how transparent are you with? Do you get twice quarterly. a year statements? Oh, that's even better. I've never had quarterly. Yeah, yeah, we pay that's out. A, that's, um, a, that's a good sign. That's a green flag, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> we we pay them out. Um, so well, actually, March just ended. So we try to have them out by the end of the month, following the end of the quarter. And we just go, you know, March, June, you know, every three months. And then the month that's following, we try to have them out by the end of that. And it has down uh, the print copies, uh, ebook copies, audiobook copies, that kind of stuff. Um, something uh, just to throw out there, too. If you're dealing with a small press, or actually if you're an author, period, and your book is available on Amazon, and let's say a majority of your sales are through Amazon, and a lot of times, if you're not, if they're not through your own sales, they are through Amazon, uh, through small press or, ind or indies. Um, Amazon has a Author Central where you can go on, you can set up your own account, um, and you can claim the book. Or it's like, yes, I'm the author of that book. Yeah. You can track the sales of that. Oh. So, I mean, I had uh, had one author. Uh, it was several quarters ago. Um, you know. The, thought that she didn't get paid a royalty on one of the books. Well, it was a book that was returned. It's like, yeah, it showed a sale on there, but it was returned. But that's all other issue, though. But mm -hmm. she was tracking her books, though. You can track your sales, you know, as well of your book, and which is kind of nice because uh, depending upon you know how much information you have in there, it's nice to see where your book's being sold. Also, we have one author, fantasy author. Um, for some reason, a majority, a majority of her sales are through ebook. Uh, in the in like. Europe and France and stuff. So it's like, I don't know. She's got a lot of 
a lot of people she knows over there or whatever, <laughs> but she's just over around the Jefferson County, you know, so, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. But it's nice to be able to see. And what about remainder sales? I mean, that's something else to look at. There's, you know, I think some authors have kind of, a lot of times with small press, mm -hmm. a lot of times with small press, you do not have remainders or returns. Mm -hmm. um, you do not have them because of uh, use of uh, POD print on demand. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a smaller um, smaller print runs, so you don't have that. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever small press and uh, self publishing is wanting to place their books in stores. Um, say in the you know in your mom and pop stores or Barnes and Noble or something like that. Uh, sometimes they might have more difficulty there also. Say Barnes and Noble for example um, wants to uh, they, they like to get a lot of their books through Ingram. Ingram's not a distributor. Ingram is a wholesaler, which means they can get anywhere between 55 to 60 percent off of the books that they order through Ingram instead of a traditional 40 percent off discount through a distributor. So, whereas a lot of some of the bigger box stores might tell authors that, hey, you know, sorry, you know, Ingram has, Ingram likes to list them as non-returnable, okay, even though they are returnable, or they'll say may not be returnable, that kind of stuff. Um, but with small press, if you're not doing a huge print run, then you don't have returns. You know, you can just print more whenever you need them. The large publishers, all, everybody uses print run. I mean, a POD. Everybody, no matter whether you're, you know, Harper Collins or, or 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 Disney or whatever, you know, they all use it. It's just to the degree that they use it. You know. Yeah, that's what um, Joanne is asking. How do you print on demand? Do you allow returns on books at the bookstores? And if so, who absorbs the cost of the printing? Well, if we're placing it into a bookstore, we do, because I mean, it's returns. Um, now, if we have books, and that goes ties back to royalties a little bit also, if we have books placed in a couple of different bookstores, and let's say I've got 10 in one, 15 in another, and 20 in another, um, yes, those went out, but we do not pay royalties on those until after the service time that they're in there, because there might be returns, and since we're out the cost of those going, and then once, say, it's, um, it's three months later, and then they return whatever... Um, you know, it wasn't sold or whatever. You know, basically we do the math that way, and then that way the returns that are out there, they're not at the author's cost. The only reason they would be at the author's cost is if, uh, you know, I can't think of any reason they would be at the author's cost. You know, at least from us. Um, She's also asking, um, as I understand, the bookstores do not like books on demand. Do you find that to be true? Not like what? Books on demand. Oh, bookstores not liking that? Yeah. Oh, well, again, it, it goes back. It's not so much that it's a, a print-on-demand or POD. It's not so much that. Um, it's how much they can get for it. Well, like I said, Barnes & Noble, um, they like to go through Ingram. Well, if your book's not available through Ingram, or Ingram likes to list it as non-returnable, even though it is, um, they like a bigger discount. Right. Our standard bookstore, teacher, library, it's 40%. 40% off, you know, that's the distributor discount that goes through for them. If they want to get it through Ingram, though, they can pay 55, 60% off. So it's at a 40, that's 20% more discount that they get. And that's what they like. So it's not that they won't, it's that they don't like it because they like more money um, that route. In all honesty, we do not, unless an author's going for an author signing, we do not typically focus on getting authors into uh, the big brick and mortar bookstores. We t we like to focus on the mom and pop bookstores and the small bookstores and uh, those types of things because there's limit the bookshelf life. Um, it's a whole other thing. <laughs> um, there's like the bell curve, okay, for traditional, and then your uh, small press and illustrating. The bell curve is a little bit shorter and higher. For traditional books, uh, publishing, you're looking at, you know, for a fiction, anywhere between one to three years, you know, life of the book before it kind of like gets backlisted. Um, for small press and traditional with POD, it never ends. As long as the author's marketing it, going out there to shows, selling, 
there is no backlist on it. it it's always in print. Um, the for large houses, most of their sales are made within that first 120 days. And if you go into any large Barnes and Nobles and you see those displays when you're first walking in there, and you might see like a couple of hundred books. And then the next month you see somebody else up there. That doesn't mean those couple of hundred books got sold. You know, maybe a hundred did, and then 200 of them got returned, got sent back, right? But but the companies they basically have that rental space right there. And then you look a year later. And you can't find that book in their store either. Or if you do, you find one copy or two copies back in whatever particular genre section it is. Um, nonfiction, if it's good and it's a timeless stuff, sometimes the life, shelf life on that can go five to ten years. You know, if they're good, good points. But um, because of that, I mean, yeah, you go in and every author dreams of having that big, you know, author signing at Barnes and Noble or Books a Million now or whatever. Um, yeah, sure, you know. They might sign you up there to have the book sale, but after that, in all honesty, they're going to keep probably as many of your books as they do any of those other big name authors, which is about two or three back on the shelf in the genre. So we don't even try to get. You know, and I think book signings, especially in bookstores like that, are highly overrated. I mean, it's true that people come up, ask you where the bathrooms are. You sort of end up being. um, (laughs) Yeah. It's it's very true. I mean, it happens. You're more like Info Central. You are that. That is exactly who you are, and then you find the one guy who feels bad for you and buys a book, and et cetera. I, I, you know, I just think those are largely overrated unless you already have such a big name right. already. For a for a book launch, um, we tell authors make that about yourself and your book. There, um, we have one who it's a, like a Irish related a little bit, and the last two, her first two books we did on uh, St. Patrick's Day. Had no. family there, friends there, sold books to them. You know, did pretty good there and everything. But it's just about having fun. And know. it was an event. It wasn't exactly. just book signing. It, it was like, uh, one, like it, one time we threw boomerangs in a bookstore. That was so cool. I had these indoor exactly. things. But exactly. it was an event, not just Walmart Not just reader. getting in there, yeah. sitting down in a table. You know, right. there it is. No. The, the best way for independents uh, and small press authors is to get out there. It goes right back to what I said before. They haven't read your book. They don't know if they like it. They may not know somebody that does yet. But if you're doing something that looks fun, it's in tight, throwing boomerangs it up. I mean, yeah, let's go check this cool. book out. That was you cool. Know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, or you could be like Debbie, who writes inspirational romance. The guest we had last week, and uh, she um, at book signings. What was it that she was telling the story? It was like around Valentine's Day or Mother's yeah. Day or something, yeah. and she was finding all of the lonely guys that were running around the store trying to find a gift exactly. for their mother. <laughs> it's that timing, yes. Um, yes. But you have to get out there. You know, you, you have to get out there and, and do those types of things. Um, and if you can tie it in, which is another reason why uh, we like doing like with the author events through Handcar Press, um, is because you can get out there with other authors too. And sometimes people are afraid. They, they want to do their book signing. Now, your launch is different. I mean, book launch, that's you know that's about you and your book and having fun and having a party so everybody can celebrate you know, the work that you did and you know, the, the little baby you brought into life, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, I say that as a guy, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, but I like it whenever authors can get together of different genres can get together. And that's what we do at the IX Center too when we go there is um, you know there's fiction, there's nonfiction, there's children, um, you know, there's young adult paranormal, there's, you know we had one author there not last year, a year before had a serial book, you know. But um, it, it's just uh, you have to because you can see how other authors deal with um, with the crowd as well. You know how they draw them in, and you can learn from them as well. You can't, as an author, you can't be out there by yourself. I mean, if you are, you're going to, you're going to get discouraged. Your marketing won't keep it up, keep up, you know. And if you haven't fully developed your marketing plan, um, you know, you just, no one like. I mean, it's 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 solitary enough being an author, okay, <laughs> and then doing all of the writing on your own when you know. But then when you finally get it out, you want to share it. You can't go the whole route where I'm the only one that's going to be here or I'm going to go here. It's And when you go, you have to open up. You have to grab the cards of the other authors. You have to see you know, what they're doing. You talk with them, and they, you continue the whole education, research process. And that's no matter whether you're self-publishing or you're traditionally publishing. The education never ends 
because the industry never ends. There's, I mean, there at one time it was only print, and then there's print and ebook, you know, or then there's well there there was audio actually before, you know, the ebook, and then but then the audio industry has changed now as well. Uh, the ebook industry, there's Kindle, there's EPUB, um, and then there's different levels of that. I mean, you have to you have to keep up with that and how you can get your book out there. Yeah, and it's kind of like a blessing and a curse at the same time because a long time ago it was just you were just given this one option yeah. and it would take you forever because they had all of the control. Right. You know, so you had only one choice, they had all the control and you just had to obey the every whim and now it's we have so many choices now we don't know what to choose. Right. Uh, there's physical tours, there's blog tours, there's, you know, uh, bunches of stuff out there. Uh, and there are some people out there that have come in to fill that niche, you know, for uh, for helping authors to market their books also instead of marketing plans. Um, but again, there you have to do your research on them and get references. Um, but yeah, we we work with one who's out of Dayton, um, you know, that we refer people authors that are over that way. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's the business side of writing, no matter what. Type of publishing you're doing. So, for those who are looking to publish their book and are considering small press publishing, and they want to find out more about Logan Neal Publishing, how can they do that and get in contact with you and uh, get that information? They can go to loconeal.com. It's L-O-C-O-N-E-A-L, uh, and the information's right on there. There's a submit page right there. It has a basic general guidelines. We do electronic submissions, um, and it says it has on there also what we accept for our submissions as well. Uh, the only thing we do not accept is explicit adult erotica or hate fiction. Those are the, the those are the areas we do not uh, cover. Um, and we, in all honesty, we do that with the hand car press also. Even though you would be paying, we still we still don't accept. Uh, you know that party. Even if you were paying, we still don't accept that part either. Um, but they are what not just local Neil. Um, I mean, we do multi show We do fantasy, sci-fi, mystery, suspense. You know those. Um, but there's pretty much a, a small press author out there for anything. So depending on what your genre is, look around. You know, see what's going to be the best fit. You know, someone else might besides us might be the best, a better fit. Um, depending on where you live, ge live geographically or whatever, um, or we might be, you know, maybe I answered questions better than somebody else did. But loconeal.com, uh, and if you're interested in the um, uh, publishing partnership or a la carte services, because we do just editing or just illustration through that also. Say if you plan to do everything yourself, you can just do that. And we also do audiobook conversion, ebook conversion, and that's hand car press. Dot com hand car just c a r at the end h a n d c a r dot com hand car press I'm sorry hand car press dot com there we go got it hand we all mess press. up our own link <laughs> <laughs> Joanne says thank you very informative this week so I hope that answered everyone's question so before we end this is there any other last minute questions any of you all wanted to ask real quick. Dana, Sophie. I'm good. All right. Thank you so much, James, for coming on and sharing everything with us today. My it was pleasure. Really informative. I've really learned a lot. So I'm looking forward to uh, finding out and checking out your website too and finding out more. Okay. You have some interesting stuff. So. All right. Thank you. So All right. for everyone, that's it for the. That's it for this week's show. So if you would like to find out more information, we are doing a whole month of fiction writing this month. Um, you can check us out at FreelanceWritersAcademy.com or check out the Kingdom of Paid a lot at FreelanceWritersAcademy.com. Until next week, take action and earn what you deserve.